Hello, LATTE members, and welcome to my presentation. My name is Lauren Anderson, and some of you might remember me from the LATTE conference last year, or maybe I worked with you or visited your classrooms during the 2019-2020 school year. Um, I was in Latvia on behalf of the U.S. Embassy in Riga and got a chance to travel around the country and meet many of you and see the wonderful things you're doing to share the English language in your schools. Unfortunately, with the current global pandemic, my plans to continue to stay in Latvia doing that same job for the 2020-2021 school year were canceled. So in July, I returned to the United States, but I was really excited to have the chance to return virtually to get to share um, some ideas with you based on things that I've heard that teachers in the U.S. are doing um, kind of to be prepared for a school year where we all hope to get in-person time with our students and also recognize that we need to be prepared for those sudden changes should school return to um, an online format. So here in the United States, um, the school year has started in many parts of the country. Unfortunately, in the US, we have still uncontrolled community spread of COVID-19. So many of the schools that opened um, have already had to close again due to large outbreaks of the virus. Again, in the United States, the situation is quite different than in Latvia. So my hope is that you guys continue on the path you're on and are able to really keep the virus under control because I know here we've already seen um, many schools have to close again. And um, for example, my children's school there, uh, they'll attend the Chicago Public Schools. They've already announced that they will be fully online until November, at which point they will reassess, you know, the possibility of, of having some type of face-to-face -face instruction. Other schools have chosen a hybrid model where, for example, students will come to school for two days, have two days of online instruction, and one day of learning tasks at home. So obviously, there are lots of different options out there, and I think teachers have really focused on doing what we do best, which is being flexible, being prepared for any crazy situation and, and just really wanting to continue to give our students the best possible instruction despite the challenges and the circumstances. And I know the teachers I saw in Latvia are also, you know, taking that task head on and really wanting to continue high quality education for their students despite the challenges we face. So with that in mind, I put together just a presentation mostly full of some of the tips and tricks that I have seen other teachers using here in the U.S. and hopefully you will find something useful to use in your classroom. I know after you watch this presentation you'll be asked to answer a few questions to check that you really watched the presentation and all I wanted you to focus on in each of the areas I talk about how might you use the things that I talk about in your classroom? Very likely you're already using similar ideas. Share what you've been doing. Or maybe you see something I talk about and you think, okay, that doesn't really work in my situation, but I can take that idea, change it a little bit, make it fit in my context. So all of your questions will be related to how you can take the different um, ideas that I share and relate them to your own classroom. So I hope you find something useful. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get everyone to see what I see. Okay, now let's get this out of the way. 
I need to find like a smoother way to do all this, right? I don't know. Some of this stuff, I'm still just doing my best, right? Okay, here we go. Welcome screen. All right, online learning in the U.S., an update by Lauren Anderson. That's me. Okay. So we're going to talk about some best practices to start the year. Again, I'm really in my mind thinking in person and online. So you'll hear me kind of talk about both because hopefully many of you are going to get to go back in person with your students, which is a great way to start the school year. I know some schools here have taken on a plan where they will do one day in person outside just to meet their students and then transition right to that online learning. I know many people are very anxious about the idea of starting a class and never having any face-to-face -face contact with students. So that's been one idea of how to deal with that um, in a safe way. We'll talk about student-centered classrooms, which based on my observations and traveling around Latvia is probably the number one recommendation I have for, um, for most classrooms to really focus on becoming more student-centered. Well, I'll share a few tools that I've talked to teachers here and seen them using or used myself. I'll share just a couple of quick game ideas that I think work just as well online and in person, in a way. And um, then we'll talk about something new that I've been learning about since I returned to the US, which is the growing idea of value creating education, which is actually um, a philosophy that came out of Japan that is beginning to gain popularity worldwide. And it was something new for me, so I thought, maybe it would be something fun to share with all of you. All right, here we go. So, starting the year, you know, one thing I do every year, first day of class, and actually I have taught fully online classes before, that's always been part of my practice. Usually, I will be honest, it's at the higher education level, so I'm working with adults that has two sides to it, right? Because many of the adults I work with are actually much less technologically savvy than my seven-year-old, right? In some ways, I thought about just bringing him in for this presentation because he is like a technology wizard. He's like, mom, can, don't you know that control D mutes your microphone? Like, no, I do not know these things, Marshall, but thank you <laughs> for sharing, right? So, Actually, younger kids are more familiar with technology. On the other hand, adult learners are obviously much more independent, so that helps. But um, I do have experience teaching fully online classes with students from all over the world. You know, I have one student in Haiti, one student in China, and we, we spend the entire learning process online. So whether it's a class like that with adults, or when I've taught second grade in person. I begin the year with a process of rule creation. I do not create the rules for my classroom because I strongly believe in the philosophy of student-centered learning. I think my students need to gain experiences. They need to gain experiences that will help them even not thinking about the English language, right? Experiences that are going to help them in any job they take on or any aspect of their life. And I think that starts from taking ownership of the classroom environment. And I do this, you know, again, I've done this with second graders. I've seen it done with kindergartners in a language immersion setting where no students are native speakers of the instructional language and yet they go through this process with a lot of visuals, a lot of very simplified language and still find it successful. So, you know, I love objectives. My day one objectives for the content is classroom rules. It's understanding the expectations. With older students, it's also where I share my syllabus and get their input. My language goal is the imperative. It's a great time to show students um, the, that command language, right? That use of the base form of the verb without a subject 
to create the imperative. Um, with younger students, you could even think of it just as focusing on verbs, right? Action words. You don't necessarily need to get into the idea of the imperative yet. And I think the transversal skill there is cooperation, right? Really being able to use language with your peers and your teacher to create a shared reality, essentially. So I have a couple of ideas for this. If you're teaching those younger students, I think it's okay to do this in, um, if there is a shared native language, for example, right? If, if we're talking about first graders, maybe you want to do this idea gathering stage in Russian or Latvian, depending on your context, and then help them translate and kind of use that as a time to share some of those main verbs. Um, with older students, I think it should be completely in English. You know, I'd push for as much English as possible, even if that sort of simplifies the language that's available to the students. I start with asking students, you know, what do you want this classroom to look like? When we're all learning, and someone walks in, what will they see? What will they see us doing, right? What will they hear? What will it feel like to the people in the classroom? What might it feel like to a new person walking into the classroom? You know, what do we want them to feel? Again, with younger students, if I want to avoid the native language and try to focus on the target language, I might allow um, pictures. I might even have pictures of classrooms that look, you know, and you can just find those on the internet that look similar in age level. And we can say, you know, what do we see in this classroom? You can even have positive and negative examples like, ooh, this classroom, what's going on? You know, maybe this doesn't look so fun. Maybe this is, doesn't look like a good learning environment. Oh, this classroom looks like one where we see students learning. How do we know they're learning? What do we see? And you can really start to build some really simple classroom vocabulary that way, or again, asking more advanced students to give you more complex answers, right? That include those because, you know, how do you know more reasoned answers, okay? And then just thinking about that big idea of how we can help each other learn. So I have students generate ideas either in pictures or writing. I give them time to turn and talk to each other. We'll talk about that in a minute or draw or write on their own. You know, older students can be asked to think about their most positive language learning experiences and maybe call upon some negative. I try to stay in the positive, but I think it can really help some students to think about what they don't want, right? We've all been in those classrooms that didn't feel safe, that didn't feel like you could take a risk. Um, and we've been in those classrooms where we're excited and we feel like the sky is the limit and we can try anything and, and our teacher will support us and our fellow students will support us. So what makes the difference? We get into those ideas and then we start to work on thinking about, okay, this is what we want. What can we agree on? I usually don't use the word rules because that's not, you know, people think rules, they think of some authority. I don't want there to be necessarily one authority in the classroom. That's too much work for me. I don't want to do that. I want us all to share the authority in enforcing these rules. I want students to hold each other accountable and they will do that. I've seen kindergartners do it, right? Actually, kindergartners are kind of better at it, honestly, than the older students sometimes because they have no shame in yelling at each other. Anyway, we take all their ideas, you know, I might take their pieces of paper and kind of read off what I'm seeing. Sometimes I have students raise hands and give ideas and I say, that was a great idea. Who had something similar, right? Or we, I've had students have a wall with their post-it notes and you try to find similar ideas and add, you know, I put up a few big ideas and they add if they think their idea is similar. Basically, I'm trying to show them that there are certain things we all want right? And we try to simplify down to three to four key rules and they need to be general and they need to be simple. I'm going to pop up right now an example of some rules I've seen 
in a classroom before, okay? It usually comes out something like this. Again, I'm kind of directing it a little bit. Obviously, I want their authentic ideas, but I do have a little bit of an idea in mind of where we need to go. They might come up with something like this. We agree to be respectful. I don't know if I'm blocking this with my face. Let's move my face, okay. We agree to be respectful, to be a good listener, to participate, and to make mistakes, right? And we then, let's say we come up with these rules, we all agree, I write them on some piece of paper, students sign it to show that they agree, I send a copy home to parents in the native language um, instead of the target language so that parents can, you know, or maybe side-by-side -side translation is good here so that everybody fully understands these rules. And then I have students kind of do, now we're gonna go backward. Okay, well, what does it mean to be respectful? What does that look like? What does that sound like? What does that feel like? How do you know if someone's a good listener? Are you a good listener if you're raising your hand while someone else is talking? Probably not. Then you're just kind of waiting to talk. Are you a good listener if you're looking at the person who's talking? Okay. Again, with older students, make it more complex. Get them to tell, like, how does it feel when someone's really listening to you? How can you tell? How can you tell when you're being ignored? With younger students, maybe more physical modeling. I'm going to pick two people to come up here, and they're going to show me how they would sit if they're working together and actually going to listen to each other, right? Or you do a little bit of physical showing. Good listener, right? You know, you can really spell it out for them with some physical pantomime if you need. What does it mean to participate? Why do we want to make mistakes? Oh, that means we're trying, you know, you just try to really, whether through visuals, physical demonstrations, the native language if need be, with some translation hopefully, or with those older students really getting them to think and share with you, you know, what does all of this mean? How am I gonna know when this is happening? I bring these rules up all the time then throughout the rest of the year. You know, it's very easy then to say, whoa, I noticed that we are not being respectful right now and this is something that you all agreed was the only way for us to have a good learning environment. Right, and notice here again, I'm able to, especially with those older students, focus on um, talking to them about that this is imperative language. Notice we, this, it's a complete sentence, although we don't have a subject, right? And you can kind of get into that language teaching while you're building that classroom community. So I think that um, whether you are online and asking students to submit ideas in the chat forum or share them out loud or send them to you in an email. And again, then you're focusing on what would make sense for an online classroom, different rules, right? We're not going to lay in bed, we're not, you know, whatever it is, we're going to try to be prepared to learn, we're going to mute our, you know, whatever it is. The online environment is different, and I think students already have experienced that, so they know, right? They know that um, that looks a little bit different. And this is a great, I, this is a great time for you to assess your students' emotional readiness to learn, their preparedness to be in the classroom. Um, what kind of experiences are they bringing to your classroom? Because that's important to inform your instruction. Um, another thing, oh, let me move my face again. Get out of there. Okay. Um, another thing I always do in the start of the school year is really work on routines. Again, I don't care if this is adults. I will do this with adults too because they need this practice, actually, sometimes more. But through all ages, I like to give the first few days, the first few weeks, really, is a time to practice these routines, right? So when I say turn and talk, what does that mean? And I start with just fun questions like, well, fun for me. What did you do this summer? With younger students, simple. Favorite color, turn and tell the person next to you. And we just really practice, right? And I give them that feedback. Okay, that went well. I saw all of you turn, share answers, and then turn back to me and get ready to listen. Turn and talk looks different if you're in online meetings, right? 
you're going to have to practice those breakout groups. If you don't know how to do breakout groups in like a Zoom meeting, you should look at those tutorials because you can kind of do the same thing. Or a turn and talk might be um, teaching kids how to do like in the chat feature in most platforms, you can send your chat message to everyone or you can send it to one person. So assigning students partners and then teaching them how to click on the, that person's name and just send a chat to them, right? I like to use turn and talk. I think it's one of the most vital tools in a language classroom. What you don't want is the teacher asking a question and students raising hands to answer. You are wasting so much potential there because one student answers, or maybe a few if you have time to call on a few. In turn and talk, every student speaks and listens to every question you ask. You are getting more bang for your buck, as we say in English. Um, another big routine I like to focus on in the beginning of the year is listen, think, then respond mainly because that's one of my biggest problems in my adult life. I start answering questions before I listen to the end of them. I don't think before I respond frequently. That's me. I just, I do my thinking out loud. I know after working with more introverts in my classrooms that that is very fast for them. And working with students of different language abilities, well, my higher level students have already spoken before my, my students who need more processing time have even had a chance to think. And because of that, I, I require no hands up, no shouting out answers, no typing anything into the chat for a good, you know, 20 seconds um, after I ask a question. It's a think time. You know, sometimes we're going on a faster pace and that's okay too. Again, people get scared to slow down because they think they're going to lose students, but you're losing different students when you go fast. So you need to find that happy medium. Don't just follow the lead of the students that are most extroverted, most willing to be out there. Um, then you're losing those students who are happy to just let everyone else do the work, right? Put it on everyone to take the time to think before they respond or give them the time to turn and talk and work out their answers with each other before sharing with the whole group. Um, a specific online tip that I actually think would work well with younger students in the classroom. I saw um, one of my children's teachers had a stop sign, right? And she had a stop sign. She had a mute your microphone sign, and she would hold up these nice visual reminders um, to show students' expectations. I think in the language classroom, visuals are the key. Um, if there's something you can point to, this is a turn and talk time. This is a think on your own time. This is a stop. It's my turn time. Whatever it is, if you have something visual to connect to your speech and you use it from the beginning of the year, um, you'll find that you're reaching up many more students, right? Some of us are very visual. We're not always listening, but we see what you're doing. And if you're pointing to something or holding up a sign, you're gonna just reach more students. Okay, another key feature of the first week of school for me is always goal setting. Again, I don't care if I'm working with kindergartners or if my students are 75 years old. I'm, I'm saying that as a true experience. I have taught English to people in their 80s, right? And we do the same thing. We set goals, set goals right away. It's really great information for me. And it's really um, a lifelong learning skill, right? That transversal skill of planning that you see in my objectives there. So my objectives there, usually it's a reading focus. I'll tell you why in a second. Language, great time to work on the future tense. Um, or just those sentence constructions like, I want to be, da da da, right? And with younger students, you're going to have the sentence all written out and they're just filling in one word. With older students, you're letting them develop more complex language to explain their goals. Um, it's, I said reading is the content goal because I usually use 
I would say I almost always use a mentor text, right? A mentor text are those high quality, not textbooks. Textbooks are never mentor texts because textbooks are not high quality. Sorry, textbook publishers. And they are not real authentic language, right? So what you need is real text, right? A mentor text that you can refer to all year. Well, remember when we read, remember when we read, you know, you can always turn back to it and pull it back into the conversation because it's a, it's a source of high quality, authentic language. For younger students, there's a million great picture books out there, including um, ones that are read online. I love how I did not properly underline the title of those books, like you do in American English. Sorry. Anyway, I just gave two quick suggestions. I love the book Someday by Eileen Spinelli. I think it might be out of print now. I don't know. That would be very sad. So I also recently read a book called Goal. It's a soccer focused book by a woman named Mina Java Herbin. So there again, just Google search mentor text goal setting, like sorted by language levels and eight. There's so much out there about how if you work hard, you can achieve a goal. That's all you're looking for at that age, right? If you, if you put in the work, you can get what you want. If you dream it, you can do it. Anything like that um, you want to read students something to kind of inspire them and then say, well, what are your goals? We're learning English. What can you, do? why would you want to learn English? What do you want to be when you grow up? You know, maybe it you don't think it has something to do with learning English, but I can tell you that if you're a doctor, you might have a patient who doesn't speak Latvian and, and you need to communicate with them in English, for example. So you can really kind of bring their goals into the language classroom, even if you wanna talk about broader goals. Again, with younger students, do they need to understand every single word of the picture book you're reading? No, they don't. That's why there's pictures. Can you simplify the language a little bit to get closer to their level? Definitely, right? I do that, I read the book first, and then when I read it to the students, I maybe don't read it. Sometimes children's picture books are like, really long. You're like, what are we doing here? I don't, I don't, can't keep their attention for this long. So you give kind of your little paraphrased summary of each page. Um, with middle grade and older students, I suggest taking it more toward, you know, there are so many online articles about the power of goal setting and the steps for goal setting. And with those older students, um, secondary students, you can get into the research a little bit. There are great research articles about there. Look on Google Scholar, um, the power of executive function, which is the that ability that our secondary students are just developing in their, you know, if you think about developmental psychology, it's about 25 that your brain is fully able to understand consequences and plan for a future you are at a critical point for helping students develop that if you're teaching students in 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, right? So show them the research out there about how powerful of a skill that is in our brain when we can think forward to something we want and then plan the steps to get there and, and make those promises to ourselves and keep them, right? So um, make sure though when you do this goal setting that it's not a one and done. I usually have students post those goals in their notebooks with younger students. That's actually what I use for classroom decorations for at least the first while of school. Put them right on the wall. I have them illustrate a picture of themselves in the like you know they will draw themselves as an astronaut or a doctor or whatever and I will help them with that language. I want to be a doctor and we will have those posted around the classroom as a constant reminder that we are not just here for now, we are here because we are working toward a future. Okay, let's see what else I got for you. Okay, so that was kind of, that's the end of the starting the year stuff, right? So one of your questions is going to be, is there anything I said that might be something you could adapt to your classroom as you start the year. Did I give you any useful ideas or maybe you and I are already on the same page and you're doing some of this stuff. 
Um, another thing I wanted to say now that I am safely, you know, get to be alone at my house recording this presentation, I want to talk about moving away from textbooks. Um, I went ahead and linked a bunch of articles here, research articles about the problems with textbooks, specifically in the foreign language classroom and why there's not a lot of research that they work. The textbook publishers have done their own studies that say that they do work. But the wider academic consensus is that textbooks are not a, a cornerstone of high quality learning. In my experience, um, it's very, it's not typical to see a lot of textbook use in American classrooms because it does tend to lead to more teacher centered um, learning. On the other hand, for example, when I've taught in higher education at the college level, they make students buy textbooks and then I feel like, oh God, my students, you know, it's, it's very typical. <clears throat> um, and, and let's say I'm teaching an English class and it's a non-credit English class. It's a class that you have to take because your English is not to the level that you can participate in academic learning at um, a university in the US. So you're not getting credit. You're probably paying at the cheapest, the very cheapest would be around three, four hundred dollars to take the class and the textbooks are another hundred. And in euros, that's even more, right? So then I feel like a ton of pressure, like I have to use these textbooks because I would be so irritated if I paid a hundred dollars for something and then my teacher never talked about it, right? So I, I will say in my own teaching, I am very used to the idea of like, okay, I'm gonna use the textbooks for homework assignments because I do think they're laid out nicely that students can work on that more independently. I don't really necessarily like that in my classroom, but they can take it and, and do homework from it. Or I need a quick, um, quick and easy, ass a formative assessment of my student's ability in a very specific grammar point. Okay, I'm just gonna have everyone just fill out that textbook page so I can come around and quickly see who was able to do it correctly or not, right? So I do think there's a place for textbooks and they can be really useful. Hey, sometimes I have a really bad night. I, I've got a lot of other stuff going on. I didn't get to spend a ton of time on my lesson plans. Usually I'll just kind of make that class a conversation-based class, but sometimes I don't have students with a language ability to carry on any sort of sustained conversation, so we focus on the textbook that day. Look, I'm not judging, we've all been there, but I do think that teachers need to think about moving away from the textbook as being a central part of their classroom because I do not think it serves you. Those textbooks do not know your students, they do not know your context, and you know, it. it's as you'll see in that last article there that I posted, there's a lot of evidence that what students do in the textbook does not transfer to real life. It is not pragmatic, right? Practicing those canned unnatural little dialogues and things do not help you um, create spontaneous language for most students. Of course, there's some students who can take that textbook info and take it right out into the real world flawlessly, but that's gonna be a minority. So feel free to check those articles out if you want more information about um, why I'm very much a teacher that feels that textbooks are used as occasional support and never as um, the driving factor in the classroom. Okay, so if we move away from textbooks, what, what do I do? You know, I'm noticing, I'm assessing my students' needs, I'm seeing, you know, based on their curricular goals, what do they need more support in? What do they already know? Maybe I'm pulling some things from the textbooks that I think, you know, activities or things that they can do for homework to support that learning, but where else can I get um, 
where else can I get resources, right? Because I don't want to make all this stuff up. I don't have time for that. Teaching is way too demanding. Let's see how this goes, me clicking on stuff. Okay, so one thing I really recommend is this AmericanEnglish.state.gov. Come down right here to English Teaching Resources, American English Resources, and this is just chock full of activities. Um, you know, it goes through each of these that you click on. For reading, they have text that you can use, right? You can um, go ahead and actually just use these, again, authentic materials, text written by authors, not trying to teach you English, but some of them are very simple, right? And many of these have been simplified. Um, but again, it's not for the purpose of learning English, it's for the purpose of getting information enjoyment, right? Real purposes. Um, they do have things like dialogues, again, and conversations, but hopefully, and even like charts to use in your classroom. So they have a lot of this there for all different modalities of language, right? I don't know why this one, this American Teens Talk is one I've actually really liked before. I don't know why it's in the reading section because it's more listening. It's interviews of American high school students, right? Oh, it's both written and audio, right? So a lot, it's all free download um, resources. So you'll find a lot of really good stuff on here. That's getting into not the teacher's corner. Yeah, really just looking at these resources, but there's also lesson plans and ideas that are posted on here all the time. There's webinars, you know, there's these like books of activities that you can use. Again, I see my students need this. Okay, I'm going to go into my resources and pull things that I think would be useful based on what I'm actually seeing my students needing. Okay. Uh, whoops touch and stuff. Okay. I've probably already gone on and on about New ZLA. I've actually heard recently that they changed some things and now you have to pay for more stuff. Boo. But this is um, news articles. Come on then. All right. Sorry. Yes. I thought I already did all this to prepare for this, but for some reason this new window is deciding to pretend that I didn't. Anyway, it takes um, actual stories, current modern news stories, and offers them to you at, let's look at this TikTok one, I love TikTok, and then if you look up here, it says Max, that is in the original format taken from the news, right? It gives you a word content and a text level. It's a very high text level, so I want to put it down to, um, these are Lexile levels. If you don't know what a Lexile level is, feel free to check that out. Um, a lot of the newer like standardized tests in the U.S. give you your students Lexile level, but you can pretty much figure it out just by clicking. They're going, okay, text level five, right? So that's more like um, to someone at a fifth grade level. Again, thinking of native English speakers, so that might be more like seventh, eighth, ninth um, for an English language learner. But anyway, they simplify the language. They give definitions in the text of more complicated language, you know, lower the word count. You can actually really differentiate with this in your classroom. Sometimes I give my higher level students um, a higher level text, but everyone thinks they're reading the same thing and can discuss the same thing. Okay, let's get out of that. Also, I highly recommend the New York Times. Um, a lot of stuff on the New York Times, if you just try to pull a news article, it's going to be like, you didn't pay for the New York Times. And instead, you can go to the New York Times Learning Network. That's where they make articles free. They come with lesson plans. Um, you know, it's about strengthening literacy. Um, I would say this is definitely more secondary based on the language. Again, they say it can be used in elementary, but that's probably more with native English speakers, right? So um, there's all sorts of like new information 
all the time on here that, again, authentic. Students are practicing with this. They're practicing with real world English. This is not um, something that is totally divorced from reality like I feel like textbooks are. This is reality. The skills they're building will enable them to read the New York Times, which is a great goal for an English language learner to be able to read English language news sources. Finally, the, ooh, hello, okay. The last thing I put on here is not a link, it's just the idea of a student teaching corner. I, I noticed this especially, um, you know, I was talking about my son, he's very tech savvy, and he, he loves spending his time figuring out things on the computer. I noticed that, you know, when his class had little meetings, um, he always wanted to teach the other students things, and I don't know why, but the teacher was very, like, not into that, and I, I was like, what? That's crazy. Like, my son can give a little presentation, you can say, okay, what do you want to teach everyone? Oh, you want to teach everyone how to change your little arrow cursor into a hamburger? Because that's the stuff he likes to do. Why not let him come up with a two or three minute presentation about it and either record it or just present it live to the students? Your students know things. Um, challenge them. If they're excited, they'll be willing to put in the time to figure out how to do it in English. I, I promise you really at any age, I think, um, if they, if they like it and they care about it and you say, yeah, yeah, we'll spend five minutes at the beginning of every class. We'll have a calendar, sign up and you can teach, you can teach everyone, you know, how to do a dance or how, whatever it is that you do in your free time that you're proud of. Um, share it with the class, right? Figure out how to do it in English. I can support you. Older students, more complicated. Younger students, keep the language very simple. Just have them use the main vocabulary words and do a little magic trick or whatever it is that they think is fun in their um, spare time. And the other students listen and pay attention and are much more excited to hear other students talking rather than the teacher. And then you get to kind of just chill for a few seconds and enjoy watching your students' um, language production and give them those presentational skills. Okay. Another idea for student-centered classrooms is to focus on more project-based learning, right? That you kind of have everything a project, right? Like inquiry, let students kind of determine their own learning, right? Inspire students with some artifacts, like pictures or something, or with older students, maybe some articles or a video related to a topic, and then have them come up with their own questions and point them in the direction. There's so many simple language um, research sources, you know, like kid encyclopedias for free on the internet, and, um, you know, with younger students, ha have them even just hey, I'm going to show you a picture. Do you not know some of these words? Ooh, let's do some research practice. I'm going to teach you how to look this up, you know, in a bilingual dictionary or look it up online or find the words that you do know to describe it to be able to figure it out, right? That's a great skill. Um, for middle grade students, again, maybe it's, it's simple questions with full paragraph answers and then older students should be expected to do more extensive research and reports and just make sure that there is a, a way for them to share what they've learned. I think we often miss that step. We collect the reports and we grade them, but really it should go through peer review. It should be shared with the class in, in different fun formats, right? Students want to do that kind of thing. All right, I'm going to keep going here. Tools. Um, if you have not seen these tools before, I'm not going to get into them too much, mainly for the sake of time. I just noticed I've been blabbing forever, but I love Flipgrid. Flipgrid is free. Log in. It is a great way for students to share little videos with you and each other, right? Okay, and you can also look up other ones. So you post a question, you give your students this join code, and then they can record and share these responses, and it kind of creates this panel of all the student responses. It's really cool. Um, and then I think there are, I thought there, oh, discovery. I think you can look at other people's, yep. So you can also like, oh, the Met made a flip grid. 
cool. So you can kind of use these um, in your classroom. Just so much cool stuff for students to explore. So check out Flipgrid. Younger students, I've noticed a lot of online learning happening in Seesaw. This will probably actually open my daughter's Seesaw. I can't figure out how to, I don't know. I have one too, but it always goes right to hers. Anyway, teachers post assignments, students add responses. As far as I'm understanding, it's free. Quizlet is a great way to make flashcards for students online. VoiceThread is a way for students to narrate their voice over pictures they choose to make little videos. Pachacucha. And again, with Quizlet, you can look up other people's Quizlets. You can look up other people's voice threads and see the videos they've made. Pachacucha, same thing. It's 20, 20 second slides. So you have 20 pictures, 20 visuals, and you talk about each one for 20 seconds to make a comprehensive presentation. And you can watch other people's Pachacuchas. It's kind of like everybody got bored of PowerPoint, so now they're trying to spice it up with Pecha Kucha. So please check out those links um, in your own time as some really great tools that again can work fully online or you can incorporate them into your in-person classroom. If you're online and you're doing video meetings, if you work with younger kids, make them find stuff in their house. Find something that's a circle. Everybody runs away for a minute, comes back and holds up whatever it is, right? I've seen a lot of teachers doing that and love it. Like, find something in your house that's the color blue, and everyone runs back with their whatever, and some kids' parents are like, what? What does your teacher want? What? You know, that's me. Like, what? I have to find something brown in the house? God, why are they making me do this? But the kids love it, and you can kind of, again, send them on these little scavenger hunts and then talk about the items they find, and that really works so well with the younger students. Um, things like, again, fully online, I'm thinking in these little meetings, head tilt scale. Put your head to the right if you agree, put your head to the left if you disagree. Visual ways for students to respond, or even have them hold up little yes or no signs, um, as, because it's really hard to have everyone answering orally. So I've been really practicing with those different fun ways to do visual responses. You know, show me a fist of five. Do you feel, you know, one, I disagree, or five, I totally agree. Right? You can kind of practice having students have visual responses to your questions. And I even use that just as a warm-up for fun things. Do you like dogs? Do you like watermelon? Right? Whatever it is. Um, I've had students do little talent shows where everybody goes and finds on the internet some kid appropriate jokes to tell or a little poem to read and they have to practice and then we have a talent show where we have a list of okay you know just thinking about making turn taking uh, a little more seamless right we have a list and you, when it's your turn you get to tell your joke and we talk a lot about being a good audience. On that American English website I showed you, there's tons and tons of games that um, a lot of them involve dice and they're like really good for in-person classroom. Um, there are like random number generator, random dice generators you can use online too, but that is a little trickier. I have not totally figured out how to take some of those into the online world yet. And then of course there's Kahoot. You're sharing your screen, but your students need a device to answer on, separate from whatever they're watching the video on. So that requires everyone to have two devices. So that can be difficult. In class, it's a little easier because you can have them actually work together on shared devices if your school has some kind of computer device to use. And you can use other, you can make your own cahoots or use those of other people. So that would be another thing I would recommend checking out. The last thing I wanted to talk about and share with you is um, the idea of value creating education. So you can click on my link there if you want to learn more about the original philosophy. It started in kind of like a Japanese Buddhism um, mindset. And the idea of value creating education is that you constantly having, have your students working on things that are of value to at least one other person. So we're seeing a shift in the United States, you know, 
A lot of the jobs in higher education I've seen say must have experience in value creating education, right? It's intimidating sounding, but I really don't think it act, you know, it's just everything your student does has to be valuable to at least one other person besides themselves. And I think um, in the language classroom, some ideas I've thought about that could really mesh with that idea. Ask some local businesses if they want help translating some of their signs or menus or information into English or fix their translations because there's a lot of shaky translations out there, right? I've seen some crazy things on uh, when I'm ordering <laughs> food on, oh my gosh, what's the food app? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? You'll see a menu translated and you're like, that is not correct in English, right? So maybe offer it, hey, we'll take a local business and we'll work together on helping them translate their information for a more international audience. Um, teaching younger students, right? Have your older students in a, you know, pair up with a buddy classroom at your school. So the older students are doing reading to younger students or working with them, teaching with them, making up little games for them to play, right? Creating little stories for them, have the older students make things for the younger students and then get them together to share and learn together. They will be motivated and excited. And again, they're creating value. They're learning English for a reason that has value to other people in the world right away, right? And that is very powerful. And then I also wanted to mention exchange opportunities. Um, I think my email will be included with presentation materials, but it's Lauren Millander at Gmail. Um, go ahead and ask Rob or Inga and they can they can get us connected. If you would like your classroom to um, maybe do like some email exchange or video exchange with a classroom in the US, I hopefully can facilitate that. I know a lot of teachers here, so I can hopefully um, help you set up maybe like a one-time or ongoing exchange. Again, there's value in that because your students are sharing their world with students in another part of the world, and therefore the English work they're doing is of a true value to someone else. It's not just like some you write out, you fill out a grammar sheet, and then when you're done, you put it in the recycling bin. The language you're creating gives meaning to something someone else is doing. So that is the idea of a value creating education. Okay, and I think we've come to the end of some of the ideas I put together to hopefully give you some inspiration to try something new in your classroom or some validation that the things that you're doing already are awesome. And, um, you know, maybe just a few things to, to look forward to trying in uh, what could be a very trying school year, but just um, thank you so much for listening, and I hope to, to be back in Latvia with all of you sooner rather than later, because I certainly really enjoyed my experience and was very impressed by the English language education in your country, so keep up the great work, guys. Bye.